Hi everybody, welcome back. Michael Wagner here with Joe Lonsdale, uh, continuing our conversation. Joe, it's great to see you. So we've been talking a lot about, you mentioned in our last conversation, the various waves that we've gone through with technology and society. Uh, where are we now and where do you see maybe like the next waves coming? How can we prepare for that? Yeah, the, I think the, the cool framework in, in venture investing is always what's possible now that wasn't possible before. And you've had just so many companies created because of the internet, because of the cloud, uh, you know, you, you early big data. And you know, I think the most interesting things happening now are probably the revolution in biology, as well as various applications of, of AI. And, and, there, and there's, there's still a lot of things where the cloud hasn't touched it and hasn't fixed it. So there's, there's still kind of a long tail of these SaaS companies that are pretty interesting too. But, uh, but, but really, really bio and AI are probably the two most newly possible things. Do you think people, like, people talk a lot about AI, and there's real AI, I think, and then there's a lot of like, the hype concept of what AI and what Oh, it, it means lots be. of things. <laughs> what, do you, what does AI mean to you? So AI is a word for machine learning right now, for the okay. most part, yeah. and, and there can be more advanced forms of machine learning. Real AI, which some people call like general artificial intelligence, that's actually really scary. Uh, I personally don't think you're going to have our general intelligence that's you know human level for a very long time. Like the whole singularity thing. To me, the world doesn't move in exponentials. Where suddenly, because the idea of the singularity, of course, as you know, is that all of a sudden the computer's like gets good enough that it can like program itself and get better. So it keeps getting smarter, and once it gets smarter, it gets it starts getting smarter and smarter faster. So, so it's we're an exponential growth. At that point. We're, we're obsolete, and suddenly it's improving itself. Like if we build something smarter than us, it builds something smarter than it. Eventually, it's a billion times smarter than us, and we've created the god. And it's, it's actually very funny because you see a lot of the technology world, and people are not very religious, of course, mm -hmm. in Silicon Valley on the whole. But it's it's kind it's kind of like they're taking these aspects of of Judaism and Christianity and, and applying it to this like atheist secular religion. It's so finding it some other way. This is this is a new Messiah basically, because right, right. the coming of the Messiah has always been a part of of the, of the yeah. monotheistic tradition. Yeah. This is this is like a scientific version of the Messiah. So and, and a lot of people believe in this, and, and there's a lot of rationality too. If we can build it, it will get there. I I tend to think. If that is happening, I think it's much further away than people think. I think the world tends to move in what I'd call S shapes, and so you get these exponential advances that then mm -hmm. plateau, mm -hmm. and it takes a long time before another one. Sure. And, and, and I think we're at least a few of those away from an exponential advance that actually blows up into a singularity. Because I think, you know, if there's a ladder of of, of, of intelligence where the conceptual abstraction is like a ladder, and our, if our brain's like a hundred steps, computers maybe are on step like six or seven, and right. maybe some new advance to get to ten. I, I I don't think it just all of a sudden gets there. Now. That said, that's kind of my incentive to think that because if artificial general intelligence was going to happen, like nothing we were doing really matters, so it's, which would be annoying. Very nihilistic. <laughs> It'd be yeah. annoying for someone who works as hard as me on yeah. those things. But but so 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 what does AI actually mean right. then? So AI is actually a new way of like taking large amounts of information in different contexts and and and, and very quickly understanding it and being able to apply that to do useful things. Uh, I'll give you like a really cool one in defense. Is there's something called uh, EMP, electromagnetic pulse. And we, most people have heard about this because we were worried that a nuclear bomb and the Cold War set off would create a pulse that would destroy all the electronics mm -hmm. in an area. Mm -hmm. Turns out, uh, for defensive purposes, you can actually create these pulses in ways that turn off any electronics nearby you. So you can imagine, like, so any car or truck that's like built after 1979, it needs its electronics to go. Right. So if you were to fire an EMP at it, it would just be stuck, stopped. Right. And so it turns out you can, you can take what's called a phased array uh, it's like ele electronic warfare arrays, and it uses something called gallium nitride. It's a material that emits very, very efficiently. And you put the power on the gallium nitride, and it fires. And you could fire a little EMP blast. And if something's nearby, you could turn it off. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and our insight we had for this company, Epirus, which is a build company in AVC, our insight we had was you, can, was you can use AI to coordinate the flow of power so it all hits at once and fires much more powerfully. Interesting. So there's been billions of dollars already invested by big defense companies. And EMP, you know, it's not really used in the field, but, you, but they can fire several hundred yards with these pretty big systems. But by, by putting the AI onto a microchip to make the AI run really, really fast and putting these, we call them power chips, in these phase array systems we built and then coordinating it, we can actually make them fire much, much more powerfully. So we can hit something with a relatively small, uh, you know, phased array miles away. And if you, if you think about what that means for warfare, it's actually a very powerful defensive technology. Sure. You can, I'm watching these convoys, you know, in the past rush into <laughs> Ukraine. I'm not supposed to talk about <laughs> these things right now, but right. but if you can imagine, imagine having one of these things inexpensively hidden underground, which turn the whole convoy off without hurting anyone. 
which is kind of cool. It's like yeah. a non-lethal. Immobilizing very, without destruction. And you could use it on drones and on ships. And, and so, so anyway, so that's, that's an example of something that because we got really good at putting like these AI algorithms onto microchips that can run really fast, you can now build a better defensive weapon, right. which is it's kind of fun. These things connect to each other in ways you wouldn't expect. Right. 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 And, and, and the other way you were asking about earlier, this is the same thing in biology. You can actually understand things going on in biology you never could have understood before. So for example, you know, we were an early investor in a company that, that's since gone public where you could take a little bit of someone's blood and you can actually detect if they have cancer or not. Mm. There's two of them actually. There's Garden Health and there's Grail. We mm -hmm. were in Garden Health, which is basically it's called liquid biopsy. But what they're doing is they're taking what's called cell-free DNA. So they're taking a little tiny pieces of like DNA that's floating in the blood from cells that have died but that has not been cleaned up yet. Okay. It, takes about, it takes about a day for your body to clean out everything when okay. a cell dies. And, and if there's cancer, there's more cells dying. So there's more of this stuff going in your blood. And they find it and they actually sequence it. And, they, uh, and this is a whole, it's very, very hard because there's random stuff in the blood. It's not clear if you're finding the right stuff. But it turns out you can use statistics and you can use the math. And you can, there's lots of, of course, AI involved in how these things are working and detecting what they're probably seeing. And, and you could see if the things you're sequencing in the blood are cancerous or not. And you know if you have stage two or stage three or stage four cancer and what type it is and how to treat it. And it's now, this is used by half of oncologists in the US now. Uh, you know, when treating cancer, which is really cool. It's stuff that you didn't even have, you know, five or 10 years so ago. So it's taking something like AI where there can be a lot of hype around it, kind of getting rid of the noise, focusing on what it can yeah, do Yeah, applying it to the things we actually know we could do today, sure. right? Whether it's analyzing microbiome, whether it's, whether it's like analyzing what's coming out of a cell in your blood, whether it's, you know, doing cell engineering where you can all of a sudden, you know, use this technology to engineer cells and edit them more accurately using CRISPR. And there's, there's all these things basically that are applying machine learning in different ways to, to these environments. You mentioned a built company, right? And I'm always fascinated with whether you're in business or philanthropy, the idea of you can make it, right? Or you can find something out there that exists and sort of bring it in house. Yeah. When you're reviewing opportunities, how do you make that decision between basically build it or buy it? Um, what kind of works into that that calculus for you? Yeah, so I think I much rather would invest in a, a great company with great talent. That's like that's like much less work for me. I think VC. I, I, I shouldn't be too glib about it, but a lot of what VC really is is a lot of it's taking credit for my friend's work, mm -hmm. right? which is great. <laughs> People, it's like right? look at these things I invested in. It's like <laughs> it's awesome. It's like you know how much time it actually takes, right? it's like, and, and, and you try to help them, and you and you and you sure. and of course you spend a lot of time analyzing a space to know what space you want to go after. You have a whole network. You spend time on talent to know there's good talent there. So it, it require it does require some work to of get course. into the best ones, of course. And you, and you have to have a reputation for being helpful to them. But, but it, is a, it is a funny business in the sense that a lot of the top talent who work for me at Palantir and Adapar, uh, you know, people always go and come and leave these companies and you back them and, and they build multi-billion dollar companies and you get to get credit for their work, which is, which is great. Now, so, so I, think, I think you'd rather invest in great people. Sure. Um, we're constantly kind of mapping out these industries and looking for gaps. We hire advisors, we have people on our team, we talk to like a bunch of people running things in logistics and healthcare in various parts of finance. And you say, wow, there's a really big gap here. This is really broken compared to how it should work. And, and you try, try to talk to everyone in the space. And sometimes you'll find someone really good working on it based on the fact that you're, that you're looking into this space. But sometimes you really won't. And, but you know great people. And you say, guys, why don't you come and you come and we'll bring these people from over here. And here's what it's going to look like. And, 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 you, and you create it. And you push it forward. And so if there's already something great there, it's not really fun to build something to compete usually. But if there's something, you know, I'd rather just make the thing that was really good even better. Right. But if there's not something there at all, it's, it's, it's cool to be able to build it. What makes sense, what is fun, and kind of the intersection of the two. Yeah, you want to do something people are passionate about. It's really hard. I mean, I, I get interested sometimes in very esoteric areas, and it's kind of fun that it's broken and no one's doing it, and so it makes it fun to work on. And so sometimes something that sounds boring to others, I might get excited by it because it's like a multi-billion dollar space, like, you know, mortgage-backed security issue, te technology and issuance technology. You know, every 21-year-old, I knew like 10 years ago was trying to build like a payments company right. where it's like it was like an obvious thing or maybe it was something at a restaurant, mm -hmm. something of those payments, and it's like this like thing every 21 year old's experience. Um, like there's 13 trillion dollars in mortgage backed securities, and it was a complete mess how that worked with banks, and basically no one was trying to do that. So mm -hmm. when my guys at Palantir started a company in, in that space, and they were really good, and they're you know I, I was a big investor there, and we helped them, and you know Blend's a big public company now. I think it's going to get a lot bigger. And, and you know we are the first back backers of that because it was something with good people in a contrarian area. And so, so to me, that is it is it can be fun. What, what's fun is arbitrary. Right. You kind of you want to win. You want to do yeah, something important. Of course. So that's interesting. You got to find someone 
that people are passionate about, right? Yeah. There's so many opportunities or problems or challenges out there, and you're tackling a lot of them. How do you kind of pull things off the shelf to work on? Is it the lowest hanging fruit, so to speak? Is it the, the, what you see is the highest risk? Yeah, yeah you, want, you, want to, you want to do things that are really important to the world. So you want to do things that are big areas, and you want to find big areas where there's gaps that are broken and where something better is possible thanks to a change in technology. So there's, there's a lot of areas of our economy where, where, the, there, where there's something new should be happening, but it hasn't yet. So like in logistics, logistics tended to be, again, like a good old boys network. Right. And there's a lot, they're very asset heavy. So these guys, it's very, there's just pretty big natural barriers. And, and the interesting thing in business is when you have big natural barriers, that means you're going to get people who are a little bit lazier. It's just, just a way that it always evolves because they don't need to respond as quickly. Right. And so, and it turns out there's all these things happening with big data, with the cloud, that would let them run their businesses much more efficiently, make a lot more money. And you're starting to see the people coming up in these companies or, or my generation or even younger generations. And they're like, this is ridiculous. We're using black and green screens and nothing's <laughs> talking to each other. And it's just, we're wasting all this money. For and, 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 and exactly. And so you're starting, you're finally starting to, they're finally starting to say, wow, we obviously need to upgrade. How do we do this? And so it's actually been a great wave the last kind of five or 10 years, really for us the last five or six years, going really deep and you know, helping about 20 different companies that are working with these logistics companies, upgrading the supply chain, giving them visibility, helping them coordinate with each other, you know, helping the warehouses talk to the carriers, mm -hmm. talk to everyone else in ways that are functional. And so, 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 there's, so you, you find these things that are, that are backward and you, and, you, and you go and you convince them. And, you, and in a case like that, you'll hire a bunch of, a bunch of uh, advisors from the space, you bring in investors who run the big things in the space, uh, you throw conferences with a bunch of the guys. And so we have like five or six areas like this where we've just gone really deep and we, and we partner and work on it. That's really, and how do you, I mean, in the last five or six years, we've seen such a run up in valuations as well. And again, I think a lot about like the signal and noise problem. I think that's a lot of what, what you do every day is stripping out noise. Any yeah. tip, tips or tricks or anything that? You know, we try to have our own thesis and we, our own frameworks. And then when we see something, it can like kind of work with that framework or not. And, and sometimes you see something amazing, and it forces you to rethink your framework. But for the but for the for the most part, you're kind of we're kind of doing our thing that we're confident in, that we're seeing, that we're building out, and that gives us the ability to confidently just say, oh, that's interesting, but it's just not what we're doing. Because there's already there's already, you want it, you want to have the size of your fund be such that there's scarcity, right? You don't want to you you want to have like there's already things we're doing, and we're already having to say no all the time to things we like, and that kind of gives you then the ability to to really focus and really only do the stuff you really care about. But limiting that size really forces you, it's a forcing function for focus. Yeah, I'm, I'm gonna keep the next one under a billion dollars again. And, and everyone's kind of like, well, you know, Founders Fund just raised five, and then John Callis raised six, and Dreesen raised nine billion. These are other, other yeah, top sure. funds in this space. And you know, they're really good guys. I think they're gonna do well. I, I don't see them not doing well. But I think the very highest returns we can achieve for our way of doing it is to still keep that scarcity a little bit more. Sure. I'm sure uh, your investors appreciate it. Hopefully, hopefully, yeah. Well, I'm a big investor myself yeah, in my own stuff, so, so yeah. it makes you want to make yeah. sure it does it right, yeah. It's a great conversation. We're going to take a, a break here. Uh, I want to thank everybody for their time and their attention, and we'll be back with part three shortly. Thank you so much. Thank you, Joe.